We started together for Sharon.com. It's a website in memory of my mother. We have our own podcast where I interview. The other week, I've interviewed a U.S. congressman about the national entities. We also had the honor to speak to Muhammad Ali's daughter. Welcome to Life as a Patient Doctor. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie Moss, navigating life as a patient and a medical doctor. Join me as I interview other doctors, students, and healthcare workers on their own journeys. Listen to their unique stories on how they balance their health while caring for others in the health profession. Hello, everyone. Today, I have the honor of interviewing Dr. George Ackerman, who is a PhD and JD from Brooklyn, New York, now residing in Florida. He works in the fields of law, police, and education. Dr. George Ackerman lost his mother, Sharon Ackerman, in 2020 due to Parkinson's disease. George wanted to honor his mother and continue to help in Parkinson awareness cause and he did not know exactly how to bring change. So he started together for Sharon for the purpose of keeping his mother, Sharon Ackerman's memory alive and to share the message of partner awareness and a hope for a cure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time and to your viewers. It uh, means the world to me and my family to have this opportunity. And I always say it's not just about our talk today. It's a conversation that needs to continue on. And hopefully everyone will share this because the only way we're going to find a cure for Parkinson's disease is if everybody inside and out of the Parkinson's community gets involved. Thank you so much. I agree with you. I would love to just hear a little bit more about your background and your story. I usually go by Sharon's son, George, because this is all about my mother and the fight we're in right now, Parkinson's disease awareness and hope for a cure for so many other individuals struggling as we speak. Unfortunately, we lost, and my mother lost her fight, 1-1-2020. She had Parkinson's disease for about 15 years, we think. She didn't really affect her life independence. She lived alone. She was able to drive, shop, see her friends. The last four years of her life were where it just accelerated. We're not really sure why it accelerated so quickly, but she did go uh, towards the end to a program at one of the universities to, it's like a trial for Parkinson's, and we think they possibly changed her medicine too drastically. And that night, I got a call at 4 a.m. to rush over to her house and found her moving her furniture out of her home in fear that Nazis were going to harm her. At that point, the late-term or onset dementia also kicked in. Uh, Parkinson's is a horrible disease, but having dementia with the delusions and hallucinations made the entire process even more difficult. And I, at that point, became her completely full caregiver because she was in a lot of need and she wasn't able to be alone anymore. Thank you so much, George, for sharing that. I'm so sorry to hear what a rapid turn it took over the last four years. I, I've taken care of individuals with Parkinson's when I was a caregiver before medical school, so I can relate a little bit of of what that looks like um, in that time period. I, I would love to hear a little bit about your journey as a caregiver. That is something that we don't normally talk about. And I would love to hear your experience and perspective. My background has always been fighting for victims of crime. I started in the legal field. I'm an attorney in D.C. and Florida. Worked at the prosecutor's office for an internship and realized that just don't have the time to help victims of crime like I wanted to. So I decided to go into law enforcement again with all the calls, you don't have time, you hand a brochure and you have to move on. I was able to do my PhD dissertation uh, in criminal justice on uh, aiding African-American mothers who lost their loved ones due to murder in West Palm Beach, Florida. I, a lot of time, the criminal justice system in the U.S. forgets the family members. So you might have, unfortunately, a victim, but then those family become secondary victims. I correlate that to my caregiving because most of the U.S. government and our history and legislation until December 2023 have been like victims because the Parkinson's community has nothing at all in the United States to help support them. December 2023, they passed a bill called the National Plan and Parkinson's Disease, spearheaded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. I was a part of it. I spoke to my legislator, but they passed it finally. So it's actually history. Now it's moving to the Senate. So you and your Listeners, right now as we speak, 
can reach out to your senators and tell them to support the national plan to end Parkinson. Very urgent. Hopefully in a year or two, it'll be passed. It'll help bring pathways for awareness. It'll help find, find research for scientists and doctors to find a cure. It also will help those diagnosed with medications and caregivers. So it's really going to change the world. Unfortunately, again, it's too late for me and my family, but I'm here with you fighting for other families who have a voice but not, may not know how to use it. And it's all in memory of my mother. I love that. Turning a personal experience into meaning, into activism, and going up to legislation when I'm sure a lot of individuals, especially like you mentioned, other family members don't know where to start. I felt alone when I was going through it. You don't take a course on caregiving. I just got thrown into it just like you will as a doctor or a lawyer or a police. You just take courses, but it doesn't mean you, know, you have to actually go there and do it. But I didn't. My mother sacrificed a lot throughout her life so I could be the man I am today. And I found that it might be a challenge. I didn't know what to expect. And it was definitely overwhelming. But I knew I had to be there. She didn't have anyone else to help her. And I wasn't going to let her suffer alone. We tried everything we could possibly try. If I look back today, four years later, there's not anything we really could have done differently except for a cure. When I was going through it, whether as a caregiver or a loved one, I was lost. I felt alone. I didn't know who to reach out to. We did call a few people. It was progressing so quickly. It was too late. We saw seven to 15 doctors. No offense to the medical field. They try their best, but there's no cure. All they can do is prescribe medicine, but that's complicated because if the patient doesn't take the right amount, doses, the right timing, then it all goes out the window. We had to hire for $12,000 a month for my mother care people. I don't call them caregivers because they really weren't trained. They were just people to sit and make sure she didn't fall. Because when I couldn't be next to her, I didn't know who to watch out for her. We actually had to install video cameras, too, because she was saying they were harming her, which we found out was the delusions and hallucinations from the dementia. So it was very complicated, very tricky. I just finished my first book on this. And I'm just doing it because I want my mother to be remembered forever. I do feel she was not only robbed 20 years of her life, but also 15 or more after life because if it wasn't for Parkinson, she'd still be with, with us. My big message here is I don't want any money. We don't accept anything except that, that people know it. they're never alone. I do this all voluntarily. Some nights I don't sleep because I think about all the people out there that I've now become family with who are diagnosed fighting the disease. Somehow we started together for Sharon.com. It's a website in memory of my mother. It was supposed to be like 10 people look at it. And I noticed the other week there's a little counter hidden on the bottom and it's been over 30,000 people visit the site. And again, what you'll find there is uh, interviews I've done. Our podcast will be there. We have our own podcast where I interview the other week. I've interviewed a U.S. congressman about the national entities. We also had the honor to speak to Muhammad Ali's daughter. It's becoming bigger than me. Unfortunately, I don't sleep still. I feel days burnt out. And there are days I want to give up. But I had the opportunity last year to discover that there's about a million people in the U.S. with Parkinson's, but 10 million around the world. So I decided it's not just about me and my mother anymore. And I've reached out to and interviewed over 600 people from Africa to Italy to France to Spain to India. I've even interviewed people in Iceland, Australia. Nova Scotia, places you wouldn't even dream of thinking have people with Parkinson's or advocates. Eventually, I'll be putting those into a series of books. We've donated about $16,000 to various organizations. If you go to the website, too, it, you hit donation. All those pages are in memory of my mother, but they're not our page. They're actually pages like the American Parkinson's Disease Association, Michael J. Fox Foundation, Drive Toward a Cure, and the Power over Parkinson, there's a lot of great organizations out there, and I wanted to put them all uh, in one spot so people can find them for free. Thank you so much for sharing all those resources and really getting the perspectives from people all over the world. People all over the world can suffer from Parkinson's. I'm very interested. You mentioned dealing with burnout and being a caregiver is just like a doctor in the sense that you're giving, you're taking care of other people. You can suffer from burnout. What are some steps that you did to help yourself during that time period where you were acting as a caregiver? Parkinson, in case someone doesn't know, is the fastest one of the growing neurodegenerative diseases in the world. 
people usually, my mother had stiffness in her left arm. So towards the end, she couldn't really use it. The last year, it's a whole chapter in my book. Some people might cry reading it, but I felt it was a story and journey that had to be told. Such a horrible decline and so quick because doctors say you don't die from Parkinson's, you die with it. So Parkinson's is complicated because every single person so differently. What happened to my mother in our journey doesn't mean it will happen to someone else. Not everyone also has dementia. She had more internal tremors. So if everyone knows Michael J. Fox, the famous Canadian actor from Back to the Future. He has external tremors. So you'll see shaking. My mother had more internal. She also had something called dystonia with the curling of the toes. The first eight, nine years showed a person who can still live on their own independent. But the last four, her health just started declining every day. Whether it was her weight went significantly down. She had trouble towards the end even speaking. Then you could see the movement. I posted on social media the other day a video. I didn't take a lot of video the last year because I didn't want to remember like that. The only regret I do have getting to caregiving is I wish I had a podcast with my mother before Parkinson just to learn about her life and would have had so much amazing things to remember. We didn't. We don't plan for this. I didn't even know what Parkinson's was until the last four years even though she had it. She didn't know it herself what it was, or she didn't want to burden us. Those are things I just never will have answers for. But as a caregiver, I sat there through the tough times, the hard times, the moment of happiness, when she would blow bubbles on Sunday mornings with her three grandkids. That was my favorite time. Thankfully, we have a video, but even in that video, you could see her uncontrollably moving. Uh, but some of those things are what keep me going today. Uh, but I went through sorrow brief days I wanted to give up, like you said. The only thing that kept me going is knowing I didn't know she was going to pass from it. She was only 69. And that to me is tragic. You would think we live till 85 or more. I have a friend, unfortunately, her mother's sick today and might be passing, but to 97, she got amazing years with her. We had just bought my mother a nice little home nearby our house. And it was like a beautiful man-made lake in the back. I thought she'd have 10 years to just enjoy it. But she never had that chance to cope with it. I'm a big personal trainer, fitness. But I, unfortunately, I have my own issues. I had two major spine surgeries. I'm having another one this May. And uh, the only good news about that is I still advocate more <laughs> for Parkinson's because I can't move from the bed. So that won't stop me. But I think to tell people the only honest truth is exercise. Take a little time for yourself. But I didn't do that. And I still wouldn't do it again because my mother needed me and I was going to be there despite my own health. And I am lucky that I have an incredible wife who uh, was also my mother's best friend. She really held the family together and understood. Some people might get angry, fight, even who knows, divorce, but that never even was a issue with us. So there's actually a whole chapter in my book about my wife, my family, my kids, and how they were a big support. I love that you provided some really good resources and specifics of things that have helped you and also recognizing that burnout and grief, it's going to happen. That's the part that where emotions are going to happen. You're dealing with a very sad and difficult situation with a parent. I really like that you recognize that you did go through those emotions, but you reached out for the support of your wife. You mentioned focusing on happy moments with your kids or taking time for yourself. You said you wish you would have done more, but it's a good suggestion for everyone how important it is to care of yourself, even when it's hard to do it. Yeah, it's the toughest thing that you plan. You might be able to take a class on caregiving, but it's not the same when you're thrown right into it. I'm interested, you worked with a lot of physicians taking her to medical appointments. What was that like taking her to the doctor? It was frustrating because when you go to the doctor, you get very upset because you want an answer. I want to heal my pain and you can't. I admire and thank all the doctors that we spoke to because they're just trying to help, but we need a cure. So without a cure... Even the medicines and things, they wear off. They're horrible. And some of them do other. My mother's stomach gut was destroyed from the medicine. So that would cause more problems. And she didn't sleep many nights because of things like enemas and things that I talk about that are horrible. That's why I love the show, because you can talk about tough topics. I think if we don't talk about these things, then you'll never find solutions. And that's why I'm really honored for your time and your viewers to be here and to discuss these. But it's very frustrating, and I want to destroy the medical profession because I appreciate them. I look up to a lot, but they have things. Some of them are movement special, but there's not really much that they can do because 
they're really just giving a little few tips and then goodbye. There's only so much someone can do right now. It's really the researchers and the people finding the cure that's important. We found with research, if you do 45 minutes of exercise a day, it can slow the progression of the disease. I'm going to Boca Raton, Florida, where I'm located. It's called the Boca Ballet, and they actually have this beautiful thing. We went last year, once a year for 30 minutes. People with Parkinson's dance with little ballerinas, like girls, and it's beautiful. I'm going to probably film some of it live. I'm streaming, but it's beautiful because those people might be struggling with the horrible disease, but for a few moments, they can just enjoy life in the dancing, boxing. Uh, they have rock steady boxing in the world. There's just so many things out there, and that's why I have Fisheron.com because it just brings it all together. You don't have to go looking for 20 hours. Now you might spend 20 hours just on my website. I had a gentleman tell me he spent 10 hours and I, because, you know, we have 600 interviews. I told him, don't spend all day there. I don't want you to, but it was beautiful that he said that. I'm just a son, one person, one voice together. Our voices are so much stronger. So I've done, again, 600 interviews, but I'd probably reach out to a thousand. Many people just either didn't want to talk about it, which I respect, but some just think there's a catch on Shark Tank. You say, oh, wait, there's more, but there's not. And uh, it's just uh, sad to me as a society that people just can't do good things for other people and not want anything in return. And again, every day, even though there's now going to be a book, which is odd, we spent a tremendous amount putting it together. After all my schooling, I didn't think I'd ever write again, because enough with the writing, but I think her story, her fight had to be out there. And I try to take the darkness and put it into the positive light. And again, I've met so many incredible people and I wouldn't be here with you today if not for advocacy. Exactly. Patient advocacy. I think that is huge. And being able to elevate those voices, tell those stories. In medicine, we talk about narrative medicine. Through telling the stories, that's where we can see people as who they are, and not just a diagnosis, not just seeing a list on a computer of all these symptoms. It's important to share those stories and for health providers to listen to those stories. And that's really why I created this podcast to really sh showcase the humanity in medicine. Because like you said, it is so important. I like how you said the exercise, improving Parkinson's, because that is such a big thing with a lot of health conditions. It can really improve even Alzheimer's actually can slow dementia through exercising and pretty much everything, heart problems, and just by moving the body, increasing the heart rate can really help the body stay active. I think of Parkinson's, the word unfortunately is more like slow down. I don't think it would improve because improving means you're going to get better and Sad thing is towards the last year of my mother's life, we were lucky to apply in Florida. They just started where you can have long-term hospice, which is something you don't want to be in. But what it did is it brought real nurses into the house to check once a week and a, a phone number 24 seven. So that was great. But the downfall was when you enter hospice, you're not going to get better. That's the belief. So they actually stopped physical therapy, which is a big problem because when you stop that, the individual loses hope that they're going to get better. That's why I always use that word, slows it down, but it doesn't improve because Parkinson's, unfortunately, just continues. That's why we say, even though I'm tired some days and burnt out, I don't take a break because Parkinson's disease doesn't take a break. So why should I? I'm so glad you no said that. That's a very key point. Some of these diseases that we do not have a cure for, it can slow down the symptomatology, but unfortunately cannot improve. So thank you for saying that. It was interesting that you mentioned going hospice, because that is, like you said, a taboo topic. Like speaking on it, when I was a caregiver, I was very passionate about working with individuals who were in hospice, because I felt like those are the ones that needed the most love and time. Hope is powerful. Hope can really change individuals are impacted on a day-to-day -day basis. Did you say that your mother was on hospice? For a long term, for a year. So usually people oh. go in for a few weeks or a day, and she had it for a year because the problem is Parkinson's disease and still so new, I guess, to some or people just not aware they didn't even label it as one of the end of life uh, diseases, which is a problem. Because then you don't get the same treatment you need. But since that last year, it's just it was almost like that game whack-a-mole. Every time we tried to do something good or 
find some hope or we just get smacked in the face and just every day we'll continue again down where we tried dieting and healthy food but she kept losing weight and we said forget it get her favorite chocolate cake i anything because i don't want her to be miserable too on top of the disease for the last four years she went from being someone who could walk several miles to uh to a uh, cane after two years from a cane to a walker from a walker to a wheelchair finally bed bound the last seven days the last seven days we don't have something called death with dignity in Florida, which is sad because we treat our animals better than our loved ones. She just had a heartbeat. She didn't even exist. She couldn't talk. She couldn't see. She couldn't even move. It was just a heartbeat. So the last seven days were something in my book. My family went through hell and we also went with it. I almost say, and medically they'll probably don't agree, but I feel like I had secondary Parkinson's because I, although I didn't have a symptom, I was holding my mother's hand through it the whole time. I felt that even down to the last minute waiting and wondering, it was just a horrible, probably the worst moments in my life. But like I said, the cover of my book, I can't wait till it's out. April is Parkinson's Awareness Month, so I'm trying for that. But it's a picture of black and white of me and my mother dancing at my wedding, the mother-son dance, and she loved Barry Manilow. In my childhood, they tortured me with him, and now I love him. I even got to take her to see him once, but... It was us dancing, and it's one of my favorite photos of the moment. Not only was it the best day of my life with my wife, but one of the best moments I'll ever remember with my mother. Even then, I'm 6'2", 200 pounds, police, and it's tough to even talk about this stuff still. But we have to keep doing it, or others might not be aware. Even if we reach just one person today with our talk that didn't know what Parkinson's was, and we've changed the world for the better. One of my heroes in the world is Michael J. Fox, because he has Parkinson's. A week or two ago, he won an award, and it's the first time I've seen him. They had to bring him out on a wheelchair. He had a young onset, which is when he was 30 to 40. His life has been, in a way, destroyed due to this disease. He's raised about $2 billion towards a research, and last year they discovered something called the biomarker, I'm not an expert in science, but it might change the way people are diagnosed. Because right now, there's no way to diagnose Parkinson's. What medical doctors do is they look for other diseases and rule them out. And then once that is ruled out, you have Parkinson's. But that's not really the most effective. If you're not diagnosed properly, that's a problem. If you're not diagnosed in time, that's a big problem. And there's many that are misdiagnosed. They have something called Parkinsonians, which are aspects that look like Parkinson, but not Parkinson. And if they give him the wrong medication, that's fatal. So there's just so many topics. He's my hero. I had the honor to meet him a few weeks ago. I got a picture and spoke to him. We actually have a band in memory of my mother. We hand out for free around the world. I handed him one. And I, I thought someone would take him and throw it out, but he actually wore it. For the whole day, I had people sending pictures of other people meeting him, and he had the ban on. And I didn't even realize it because it, it was such a great uh, opportunity. But again, even meeting him, I saw the positive, but then the sad part, I saw my mother a little in him. I had to go to the bathroom after and fell apart because <laughs> it was just what this disease does. We just have to keep fighting. Thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing those experiences. I What you said also most recently is we don't talk, especially when we're talking about end of life or these very hard topics, we kind of skip over them. We just go, oh, they were diagnosed and then they passed away. There's so much in the middle, so much that the person and the family I call it secondary trauma. And it's like a secondary illness from taking care of a person, especially someone you love for so long, you are dealing with it. You're bringing those emotions and those pains with you, which can and do affect your body. I'm, I'm really glad that you have taken those emotions that in society are more taboo and we don't talk about, but they're so important to talk about because they're real. And that shows you're human. We don't need to hide them, even though society says that we do sometimes. So. Even though it's been four years, I still grieve every day. I tell my wife, uh, I don't feel it's fair. I feel like she was taken too fast because she's only 69 again. But uh, sometimes still, but for a while, we kept a seat for her in the Thanksgiving, which was sad. And uh, my, also, I like one day to write a kid's book because uh, it was hard for me to tell my three kids that what's happening to their grandmother. That's something also already in plan. I actually have it done. I just have to find an illustrator because it's more about the drawing. But there's a lot of, uh, I try to bring the positive to this mess. And uh, the future, I think, is so bright with a lot of hope for a cure. Grieving is something that 
continues on and it's been four years but i still miss her every day we spoke 10 times a day it wasn't like a normal mother-son relationship she was my best friend if you had met her today that she'd be like you'd laugh because she'd say george don't waste your time with all this go spend your time with your children but she knows that i would listen and that i would keep fighting grief like you said is not just a one-time situation of i grieved and i'm done it's a long-term process i lost my three grandparents back to back it was right before I went to medical school, so probably five or six years ago, and I'm still emotionally grieving that experience. I was also the caregiver at the end of life there in the hospital bed dying. I just recently wrote a blog about it and talked about having that grief because I was also in the hospital. I was taking care of a family, not my personal family member, but a person in the end of life with their family member. And I thought back of my own experience as that family member caregiver. I think a lot of people will relate to your story. We have a link on the site if you ever want to share your journey, because I what I do now is I've done 600. I'm cutting a little back, but basically I don't have Parkinson's, obviously, and I'm no longer a caregiver of someone alive. So I always find myself while still by there's no support groups I've ever found. So we started our own completely free. It's around the world. Once a month, if you go to Together for Sharon, click About Us and you can sign up free, anyone, anywhere. It's uh, just a place for anyone who lost a loved one to any disease, not just Parkinson. It's just a safe place for people like me to be able to meet others and talk. That's important to me because I never really found a group because of my situation. Also, for interviews, if you click interviews at togetherforsharon.com, under that, it says you can provide your own story. I'm also covering other things like epilepsy, tics, dementia, Alzheimer's. It's not just about Parkinson because so many people also have a journey. I always say the only journey that breaks my heart is the one that I'm not aware of. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. I'll make sure to link those below the support groups because I think that is so important and it helps so much being in a community, finding other people who relate to the emotions on my website for every single health condition that's on my website. I focus more on women's health conditions and chronic pain because that is my individual illness. Finding support groups and community is a wonderful way for healing. And my mother probably could have used your group because she had fibromyalgia and was always in a lot of pain 24-7. And that was another problem. It's between that and the bar. It's very hard to manage multiple things. We tried pain management, needle, everything, nothing worked. And it was just continually, it's not even just Parkinson's, unfortunately. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, pain is definitely a whole nother topic. And uh, yeah, I'm actually hoping one day in my future healthcare practice to really combat chronic pain conditions because a lot of people suffer from that. I am super interested because my husband is a neurologist. He was very excited to hear your story. I would love to hear any suggestions you have for him or any advice. The only thing is to keep researching Hopefully they can join. They have studies out there for neurologists, but more of Parkinson's movement specialists to speak out in the community. We have a spot too, we just added, where if you go to partnerships, there's researchers and scientists, and then it goes to about 20 of the world's most famous scientists I interviewed and researchers for Parkinson's, and he could probably look there. Maybe one day he could be up there. But I think the most important thing is just to contact organizations like the Parkinson's Foundation or Michael J. Fox Foundation, they hire scientists and doctors to work with them to find a cure. And again, I mentioned that biomarker last year, they discovered it's the first invention in a way or a technique that they might be able to discover if someone has Parkinson's, but I think it's like a horrible <laughs> needle to the spine, but I'm not doing this. And that's another thing that how you get Parkinson's is a mystery. I think personally, they don't think it's genetics. I do feel it might be something from the environment. Uh, my mother had a beautiful home, but didn't really keep up with it. Many houses with 20 years had termites. She had mold. She had so many things in the walls that they had to spray to get rid of it. But who knows what these things are definitely harmful to people. Now they're finding that Camp Lejeune with the military, with the water causes Parkinson's and other horrible things and also toxic uh, lakes and there's a lot of man-made things they're pouring into our water. So these are areas I think we need more doctors and scientists to look at. And we need to ban them all, like Paraguay, another dangerous drug out there. And pesticides are very dangerous. 
They tell us when they come to your house, this is safe for animals and kids, but we don't really trust them. Even the fruits and things in the publics and all these grocery centers, who knows what they're putting on any of it. And that affects your stomach, obviously, and everything else you're intaking. Again, I'm not a medical doctor, but my opinion, I think that's what definitely gave my mother Parkinson's because she had no other health issues at all. But yeah, if we definitely don't have any specific researches, but things are coming out and there are definitely a lot of toxins in the environment that can have long-term impacts of causing health conditions. The one that everyone knows is just smoking and the toxins yeah. in there causing lung cancer. But yeah, asbestos causing mesothelioma. There are so many types of things that the environment and the places that we grow up can have an impact on our body. So you were correct. I want to thank you, George. Is there any last words or pearls of wisdom that you would like to pass on to end our podcast? Feel free to visit togetherforsharon.com. I'm on every social media and I don't know why or how. I post 24 seven. I'm not an organization or foundation. It's just me. Sometimes people miss misconception because I'm on a lot, trying to do a lot. In April, if you check out Amazon, you'll be able to see the book. It's going to cover the first signs I had seen with Parkinson, my mother's upbringing, symptoms, treatments, my caregiving, and a lot more. It's 12 chapters. It was my heart and soul. I actually kept a journal her last year and never shared it with anyone till now. And it takes you really deep, dark inside somebody caregiving through everything from the good, the bad, and the ugly. But I usually end every podcast, whether it's mine or others, with this little message. This is for you and your viewers, but we love you. We support you. We care a lot about you, and you're never alone. We're a family in this fight. I will advocate for you, and our voices together are so much stronger. And I always say I'm just getting started, even though I really am not. But I do feel like every morning when I go to TogetherForSharon.com, click on interviews, a new story, if someone's journey shows up, and even though I did the interview, I forget it because there's so many. But when I see that, it re me almost like the, heck, the Energizer Bunny that know that I have to keep going, keep fighting. Again, I'm just really grateful for your time, your listeners, and hope they share this. The only way we're going to end Parkinson's disease is for everyone to reach out to their senators, tell them they want them to support the national plan to end Parkinson. This is just the beginning. We have to keep fighting. So thank you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you stating how important it is to not give up, especially if you suffer from health conditions or if you have a loved one. Keep fighting for yourself and others. I loved how you have been an advocate turning the disease and the passing away of your mother as a positive, even though a lot of people would really take over them and grief would really take a lot out of them. I like that you wrote a book and you get a podcast and website and you're really being an advocate. And that's why I was so excited to have you and bring that perspective that is it not all the times um, shown? I think it's very important for individuals that are students studying to be doctors, nurses, and take care of future Parkinson patients and also people in the health profession who might have a patient who has Parkinson's or work with other family members of caregivers to remember that there's always a story. There's always a story behind an illness. And that's why I want to humanized medicine. That's why we're here. I'm going to quickly review what you talked about today. You talked about your journey as a son, watching your mother have symptoms that showed up but not really be diagnosed until a lot later, where you then had to become her full-time caregiver and work with her going to medical appointments, taking care of her on a daily basis, even as these different challenges and symptoms arise, including hallucinations and movement disorders. It was so important to be with her through every single step. You also talked about the transition to comfort care and hospice and how those moments were very painful as a family member, but it was so important to be there together and you got through it. And I think that's also an important thing of humanity, of the ebbs and flows of life. You also talked about things that were really helpful for you on your journey, journaling, having a support system like your wife, your kids, and then also focusing on those 
positive moments. You have really become an advocate by making a podcast, a website, tons of interviews, a new book that I'm super excited about to hear. And then maybe in the future, it sounds like your wife is working on a children's book, which I'm excited about because that is also some, a challenge talking to children through that transition of life. I want to thank you so much. Dr. George Ackerman for sharing your story. Everyone who's listening, thank you so much for joining in. All the links are going to be below that Dr. Ackerman has included and that we talked about today. I hope to see you on the next episode. Take care, everyone. Thank you.